Welcome to Mirage. This is Brian Yellow. Today we're going to be talking with Arthur McAvoy. You picked the subject of Terry Brooks, which I'm kind of happy about I because I, I like Terry Brooks. I, I really enjoy him. That's one of my first fantasy authors besides, uh, you know, J.R. Tolkien and C.S. Lewis. It was this dude trying to get through the Swords of Shannara. Yeah. Um, when I wanted to ask you, well, before we talk about any of this, we should say if there's any pronunciation errors, it's not. <laughs> no, when, when, so, W H E N. Yeah. <laughs> I'm not going to say anything right. I'm not um, going to, I'm not, I haven't said anything yet. I've said your name wrong. I've said my name wrong. It's yeah. not, it's, <laughs> is, it, is it Shannara? Is it, is it, the Swords is, of Shannara? I don't know. It's, how do you say it? I just say Shannara. That's what I've always said. Shinara. Sword of Shannara. Talismans of Shannara. Is that from your, said. how do they say it on the television series? Because that's canon now, isn't it? That's like verbal straight up this is how you're supposed to say it from the god's mouth himself did you watch that show i got through maybe the third episode and i said i <laughs> did better than me with... i didn't make it through the first one they had some kind of foot race through the woods or something and yep, I lost that was like interest. the first or second scene yeah and i was going this wasn't an elf stones but okay this... <laughs> I'll, I'll, buy into it. I'll buy into it you know it was, it was john favreau right that was producing it and you know, I figured yeah, I it's got to be good. He blended his name. I mean, how, how, what does he do? He hires people to go in and oversee. I, he doesn't really do anything with the programming himself, does he? I don't know. I don't know if he was the director or if he was just the producer. But, I mean, it was a really well done show, but I think it went too far. Oh, you, you thought it was well produced? Yeah, I think it was well produced, but I think it went too far off the storyline. It was sci-fi. Was it sci-fi that did that? It was, a cha- it was a, not a regular channel. It was one of the off cable channels uh, i thought it was netflix netflix nope i don't think it was netflix it was maybe it was hulu online. maybe you're right though maybe it was online yeah i know it was on netflix for a while i don't know if it still is oh was it i yeah. don't yeah i couldn't oh, get past that first watching. season it's too bad though man right they i love that fantasy stuff i know and i was like, so excited i was like when i was a kid i always dreamed of the day because there were always these articles on his website you know that we would Oh, we got rights for Elfstones. Finally, it's years in the making, you know, and that was in 2005, you know, and I'm just going, when is this going to come out? And then it finally came out and I went, no, you guys, <laughs> this is horrible. Yeah. What have you done? Exactly. But man, at the same time, we've matured as an audience, haven't we? Like yeah, back we- in 2009, you know, 2000, what was it? Uh, the Fellowship of the Rings came out 2003, oh. 2002. Something like that. Was it before 9 11? Yeah, it was after 9 11 when that came out. But man, remember that when you sat in the theater and it was dark and had like a a rhythm happening? And then you heard that voice and it gave you the little monologue and then boom, you're there. That was startling and you were sucked in and you were okay for like awesome. Right? That's like even if the extended version, you're like, if you're a real fan, you had that. Oh, then, <laughs> you at least tried to watch it all the way through in a day you have to do it in a day yeah and the, at the end of the day what do you do you look back at the hobbit you try to relive it in the hobbit the hobbit's not bad right i guess it's the same thing it's by the same guy mm-hmm. we do that all the time looking I, at terry brooks's bibliography he does just been writing the sort of chanera for fucking for fucking 45 years or whatever know. you know never oh, stops writing the same book over and over and over again or whatever but you know they didn't time. get the Right. Man, well, how did know. you first find Terry Brooks? How did you come upon him? Um, yeah, I read, uh, picked up the Sword of Shannara, and I was reading it, and I lost it. I could not get into it fast enough, or something along those lines. It took me forever. I, I started it several times, and finally was able to get into it. And that's my case with fantasy books in general. And I have a hard time getting into them right away. I don't know why. Getting into, but once it? I do, you know, you yeah, I just can't get into it. And his work, besides the Sword of Shannara, and a few of the the girl. Have you oh, read one of his work? Yeah, the Void and Demon series. I uh, love that. That girl is really good. Yeah, what's the name? I don't remember girl. her name. She's like, she was run. She was a runner, and that was her power initially when she first was introduced. I love that. <laughs> Man, I felt like that was an interesting choice. Who was the? Was it John Ross? Is he the guy yeah. that? Was he the Druid? Dude? Ness yes, Fremark. That's who it is. is. The name of the girl, and I'm trying to remember the name of the guy that was like the demon hunter equivalent. 
John Ross. I don't remember. I don't remember. I have not. I don't know what I read because I don't think I finished it. I haven't finished any of these things, these series that he wrote. But I, I definitely wrote, read The Sword of Shannara. I, I'm aware that he did the Phantom Menace novelization. Mm-hmm. In my head, he also he's did a, a novelization of Hook, the movie with Robin uh, Williams. He, yeah, he did a novelization of that. So, okay, I'm ready to geek out one, about Terry Brooks. Okay. I'm in my, I'm in my basement, and I have a huge box of Terry all, – all filled with Terry Brooks books. And okay. so I've got everything from First King of Shannara through – is it Armageddon's Children? And then there's a really cool companion book, The World of Shannara. I don't know if you've discovered this no. at all, but there's – it's kind of like an encyclopedia – to the world of Shannara and it's got all the explanations in it of you know the realms of the dead and Alanon and Walker Bow and you know yeah, all man, the maps that's crazy tour of tour of Paranor and 41 years worth of effort stuff. basically is, is that companionship companionships yeah. are cool yeah they are cool. they have I have one for the wheel of time series also I don't know if you've read those but I've read the first four books that's another one you got to keep going because if you lose your momentum, you're not going to keep it's going. It's hard to get back into it. Yeah. It's really hard. And I didn't really get it. I thought I read four books into it. It doesn't feel like I have. I can't remember anything that happened. I know I own four books. I know there's a place in Kindle saying, you need to start here. And it's like halfway through the fourth book. You're like, where did I? But I can't this tell you. I know there's a guy in a black horse in the very beginning of the first book. So now I think I went into a coma and somehow read it. I don't know. Main character, I, yeah. I guess. I need to read. Them. Well, my, my wife went through them recently, and she said they were really compelling. They're really interesting reads. They're really but good. I, I really yeah. enjoyed those. But so back to Terry Brooks. So what's cool about him for me is I don't know if you read the latest interview from The Void this week with Catherine Karch, but she talked about not necessarily children's books, but the books that you read when you're a kid are sort of your yeah. first book that shape your imaginational tastes and the things that you think are cool and forms your nostalgia that you'll feel later in life. And Sword of Shannara is one of the first books that I can ever remember reading front to back when, you know, you could first learn to read. And I've read it yeah. multiple times. So every time I think of Sword of Shannara or First King of Shannara, those first four or five books, there, there's just a special place in my heart for these books and for Terry Brooks. Because for the longest time, until I was in high school, in early college, he was the only writer I would read. I really? could not trust anybody else because it was like, this book is not like Terry Brooks is writing. I don't want to read it. Well, he gave you a lot to look read. at, didn't he? And he uh, had like, yeah. when did you go to college? You're... Uh, 2005 to 2009. So, yeah, by that point, he had already written most of his bibliography. I mean, that's a great time to be a Terry Brooks fan. Yeah, um, yeah man, he, my, uh, just to let, um, the reason why he's important to me is the book Sword of Shannara was difficult to get into, right? Mm-hmm. Put it down, lost it, and then picked it up many, many years later and thoroughly loved it. So the experience is, you know, just because you can't get into a book doesn't make it bad. Try again. You know what I mean? I mean, mm-hmm. I felt this guy in my mind is like, oh, okay, cool. Some of the characters in the Sword of Shannara too, though, are so cool. Like, is it so is awesome? It, the Druid? <laughs> the Druid, yeah. And then the brothers, Leia, Flick and Shay, and then there's Minion Leia is my probably my, one of my favorite characters next to Panama and Creel, the guy with the leg, or is it the arm? He's got one leg or one arm, I can't remember. But the ending of Sword of Shannara is one of the coolest endings of a story and a resolution of a story's conflict, I think, with the Warlock Lord and the Sword of Shannara and its magic power. And that ending is still one of the most satisfying emotional endings I've ever come come across in a story before. You got your degree in social work. What did you tell me you got your degree in? Engineering. Engineering. Okay. Yeah. Okay. That's hardcore. (laughs) Did you branch off from uh, fantasy at all in terms of novels or is that pretty much what you read primarily? I read everything now, but until about halfway through college, all I read was fantasy. I didn't. That's and then, That's good though, right? But you don't consider yourself a fantasy author. You are a science fiction author or no? I would say fiction because I'm writing my current projects. The main ones are science fiction, but 
I have a fantasy story that I've set aside to work on the science fiction stuff, but then I am also drawn to strange fiction too. And a lot of my short stories are either horror or strange fiction. And what do you pick a genre and just kind of try to see what other people are writing or do you try to do stuff, you know, on your own exploration? Um, you know I mean, I try to do it on my own, but it's, it's difficult because to... this guy's in your head, isn't he? Like you have yeah. Terry Brooks yes. eating at your and... soul basically. Yeah. When I sat down, when my parents first got our home computer, you know, the big desk, clunky desktop tower and everything, yeah. I sat down and I opened up a word document. And I'm like, I'm going to write. I've always wanted to try this. I'm just going to write. And the stuff that was coming out was, I am Terry Brooks. I'm going to be Terry Brooks. I want to write like Terry Brooks. There's nothing Brooks. wrong with that, though, honestly. Well, I mean, no. there's nothing wrong. Like, if you sat, if we got off this podcast right now and you went ahead and wrote one of your I am Terry Brooks stories. Mm hmm you're not Terry Brooks and you're not going to ever come close to writing him. And you know what, that thing with stand up comedians mimicking each other. I mean, it's just telling jokes. I mean, you're not going to go in and riff off one of his stories because you don't have that shit memorized. No, you know, no. But come then if differently. You, and if you start reading Terry Brooks, so if you read the sort of Shannara and then you read first King and then you go back. So that's kind of the prequel to the sword. And then you jump ahead to elf stones and start yeah. reading everything to present day. Because he wrote Sword of Shannara when he was in high school, I think. 77 early. when he wrote that. Yeah. yeah, and then you can see the progression in his own writing to present day, which is, I think, really cool. You can see how a writer matures you know, over the course of whatever, 30 or 40 books. Is it the word in the idea. void? I just, I unfortunately wonder if this stuff is meant to stick or not. Like a, the original story... The Sword of Shannara, the Sword of Shannara, right? What's that called? The Sword of Shannara, right? Mm -hmm. It was amazing. Like it stuck with me. And if I read Elfstones of Shannara and the Wish Song of Shannara, I do not remember. Why I wouldn't have read those is beyond me. You know what I mean? Oh. I would have read them because you have to, so, right? It's a continuation of the story. You want to know what's going on with those characters, or is it that those characters don't continue on and that pissed me off and I put those books down? I'm not sure. I can look at the titles and go oh yeah wish song of shannara is about the wish song and i can't remember the omsford or omsford character that's you know they had the whole um, yeah and then the whole family that has the blood the elf blood in them the elvish blood in them and they can all use different the the elf stones stuff translates differently into the families so then instead of using the elf stones one guy can use the wish song yeah and and then so I'm just looking at the titles now and I'm going, oh, that's about this. The Druid of Shannara or yeah, the Elf Stone of Shannara. Shannara. I'm looking at the cover, man. It's like it's trope city all over the place. There's a yeah. bow guy. He's got a flat, a, uh, what's it called? A feather in his hat. He looks like Robin Hood. So Straight you got the Robin old cover. cover, the original cover? Wikipedia, yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah, There's then there were the newer covers that came out in the early 2000s, I think. But... So the what was cool is I, I read The Sword of Shannara because a friend of mine in elementary school said, hey, there's these books, Shannara. You should read them. They're awesome. So oh, interesting. Up, okay. loved it. So but then, they definitely kind of renewed the the covers. They made them more more contemporary. Yeah. And then the, I like the art now. I like this. This is nice. I, I enjoy the other art, too, because I like retro stuff, right? There's yes. nothing wrong with that at all. No, it's cool stuff. And then... I went to the Minneapolis Public Library and they had like four or five hardcover books for Terry Brooks. And one was Running with the Demon. And if you Wikipedia that, it's got this tree that's like bleeding this green stuff. And it's got Running with the Demon in these big green letters. And when I, I was a kid, that one. when I was a kid, I was like, that cover is cool. This book oh, is yeah, right awesome. You know, so I, that is a good book. So I read that book, but even the the font that he uses in his hardcover books is appealing to me. And just these aren't YA not, though. It's are like they? a they're weird form of. It's like what's that? Are they? They're not YAs. They're are they YAs? No, not at all. I don't think so. They're just regular fantasy stories. Yeah, they're just just books. Anybody can read them, but there's nothing in them that you know makes them adult necessarily. I don't remember oh. being super violent or anything like that interesting so i mean i know the um the girl feather what's her name we just talked about her Ness Winsong. Primark. 
Yeah, that's her name. Uh, she's young. She's a teenager. She's like a high school kid, maybe even younger than that, when they first introduce her. You're talking about the the demon in the void, right, still? I think so. Yeah. She inherited the magical powers somehow, and I can't remember. She didn't start you know, out with them. She kind of... got them through it. He's an interesting writer, right? Where is Terry Brooks from? I know he's a lawyer, right? Or he was going to be a lawyer. He's I a think, former attorney. I think he was a trial lawyer and writing on the side. And I think he eventually transitioned to full-time writing at some point. What'll be kind of cool is if we, if we, you know, when you post this and we say, Hey, we talked about Terry Brooks, you know, we'll have to tag him in Twitter. And then maybe if he comes in and listens and he can, he can write us and tell us, you know, what the true story is. But he's Man, I, I always try to get these guys on. If he writes you back, let him know. I'll interview him. I'll put him on my podcast. He'll be the Absolutely. honorable guest of the of the freaking some millennium. I mean, yeah, I got no kidding. I got Daniel Abrams to talk to me for an hour, so maybe I can get Terry Brooks. They're basically that's about the same. Really thing. Cool, by the way, <laughs> that he spent some time with you. That's really cool. I I mean, I actually thought about it later on. I was like, that hurts him ultimately. You know what I mean? You want you want yeah. yourself to be a little bit mysterious, right? You want to sell those interviews as as often as possible. You want people to wonder, and then you give them the goods. They, you know that one really badass Pulitzer Prize winning interview or whatever, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. like you know uh, Dave Chappelle or whatever gave that one badass behind the. Uh, so remember that show? What was it called? Uh, behind the studio or actor studio? Behind the actor studio or the actor studio? You have no clue what I'm talking about. No, I think I do because I've seen like the fa they had the Family Guy on the crew, Family Guy crew on there. Um, what the? Yeah, I think at the end they got a little bit. Yeah, they got a little bit ridiculous at the end. Yeah, a little bit. I think they at at the beginning they really treated it like an honor, you know, like Harvey mm -hmm. Keitel came out there, you know, and he was an artist for an hour instead of the guy who showed his penis on the piano or whatnot. <laughs> but, any, but anyway man he's on your side he's in your neck of the woods sterling illinois right i mean it's he's right up there yeah that was where he's from anyway i don't know where he's oh, living I, now i think he all of his books in the back cover say that he lives in the pacific northwest and hawaii so i suspect that he's got a place in seattle and maybe a place on one of the hawaiian islands which would be cool but he also so he did a novelization of Hook. It's Oregon, actually. Northwestern Oregon. So I would imagine Portland or near about. Actually, that whole area is so freaking beautiful. Yes, it is. It's a no really land cool outside of for fantasy stories. Yeah, I mean, it's just really nice to remote. It's, I guess people just want to be in cities out there. So yeah, much I land. So. I guess it's all owned or something. I'm not sure. It's expensive so as hell. the novelization for Hook and The Phantom Menace. But then something he also has this book out there. He's got a book called Sometimes the Magic Works, Lessons from a Writing Life. And it's only like 120 pages or something. But he talks about novelizations of movies and how difficult they are because he'll, he'll be writing it at the same time they're doing the movie because they're going to be released at the same time. But then as the script changes, the movie changes and thus the novel needs to change. And he said that after Phantom Menace, he talks about in this book that I'll never do that again. I'm done with movie novelizations forever. It's just not my cup of tea. It's too much work, too much change. But I don't know if you've ever read that book before. Sometimes the, the Phantom before. Menace, when I can't I think that came out before the movie. Did it really? I, didn't, I did not read his uh, writing guide. No, not at all. Did you read the writing guide? You did read it? I 120 did. pages? Yeah. Did you find it yeah. beneficial in terms of your own work? Yeah, I did. Just because it's cool to hear another writer talk about writing and how they do it you know that's part of why i'm doing the interviews is because it's just it's just cool to talk about that kind of stuff because it's not like you can go to work and talk about your hobby with somebody that isn't in your hobby you know what you mean yeah and, but no totally again that's why i do this right i want to have a conversation with people i want to see how things sound when i say it and i want to hear them saying it and mm -hmm. you, know, you make excuses all the time why things work why they don't work I mean, I learned some lessons through other people's experiences. I mean, you could sell your novels independently, or you can sell your, you could put your stories online, or you could judge yourself against other people who are selling themselves professionally. Mm -hmm. And if you're deemed lacking, you're not going to make a paycheck. And the goal is to make a paycheck. 
to be the best, Absolutely. right? I mean, you're going to gauge that by who's buying your work. Is Clark's World buying your work? Is Asimov buying your work? Or are they rejecting you and you're not publishing? You know what I mean? Then you mm -hmm. have stuff to work on. I think that's how you become the best. And I don't know, maybe at this point, if you don't do that first and then go indie, why are you an indie, right? I don't know. Mm -hmm. I don't know. I, I agree. I, I question. That's why I, that's cool. I have never, I've not experienced it. You, Howie, might be the difference, right? With his work, book, Wool. Yeah, and I was just going to say, he, I've got him lined up for an interview now, too. No, you do not. I do. I do. Which that's that pretty was, freaking cool. I think I've insulted that him this, actually. <laughs> that happened this last week, and and then um, Adam Inglis, because I tagged Hugh in this tweet, and I said, "Hey, I'd be honored to interview you." By the way, and then I saw that. Didn't I see that? I think I liked that. It's yeah, and cool. then Adam Inglis, he liked it, and then he replied, "I'd read it." <laughs> I was like, "Oh, that's funny. I should do this." And then. He was like, yeah, I'll interview. And then I gave him my email and then he responded right away within like 30 seconds and said, hey, here's my email. I'll look forward to your questions. And so he's a really reachable guy. And apparently he just shows up at people's book releases and, you know, will talk, talk to any writer as long as you ask him. Don't you feel yeah. like that as a writer that other writers are kind of kindred spirits? I mean, you can have multiple books. And the writer themselves really doesn't matter. It's just the story, right? You hear about this right. great book. It's not like you're going, oh, I can't wait to read that author's work. No, you don't read that great book you heard about right. on the internet or your family's telling you to read. And then the author is just secondary. Okay, that guy wrote it. Okay, let's check him out. Beyond right. that, except for and writer's best friend. For me, where I would only read him until I was in college. You know. I don't, personally, I don't understand that because I've read all over the place when I was a kid. I got lost in books. Like the library was my, my friend. Do you weren't curious what was out there or he just sustained, I mean, how'd that work in terms of. He just, just I just fell in love with his writing style. I can't even, I can't even describe it. Just the feel of the books and whatever we went to a library anywhere. The first, the, like the scholastic book fair at school. The first thing I went to was. Be, the Terry Brooks so section. Looking Brooks. Yeah, I was looking for Brooks. That was all I did. And I thought his covers were cool. I just, the font was cool. Just everything. I just, I couldn't, it was super weird. I could not there, get satisfied. There's, with no, any other there's no better smell than a freaking book fair, right? No. All those paperbacks, man. I, you're probably getting cancer like immediately being inside one. No. Sniffing. Yeah. All that glue, you know, you're basically sniffing glue. <laughs> well, there was a, there's an antique fair that my wife and I went to, and I picked up Worlds of Tomorrow. They had three huge volumes from 19, I don't know, 67 or 77, 68. It's 60s or 70s, so it was three years in a row. And the books are sitting in a closet, and now the whole closet smells like that old book smell. And there's tons of other stuff in there, but then there's these three books on the floor, and the whole closet smells like it as soon as you open it up. It's like, wow, worked it up. book. I worked at the University of South Florida Library. We'd have to run checks, make sure nobody's trying to sleep in there at night. Mm -hmm. And you'd have to run through the stacks, the old books, man. It's like they would try to suffocate you with the dust. But you're right. It's just a, an awesome smell. It just means books. You know, there's pages there. Not anymore, though. I mean, there are very few times that I go, where's my book in terms of where's a paper thing that I'm picking up and flipping through. I'm totally all about my kid, my phone. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. All my books are right there at my at my fingertips which also makes me go on reddit more off, more often than i probably should <laughs> that's true that's true did you know though so terry brooks has a science fiction book coming out soon if it's does he not has not. he never written he's never written science fiction before at this point no i don't think so i don't think so but it was on his twitter i'm looking for, i'm trying to find it street freak the that's what it's called street freaks but you know all of these other like he writes these urban thrillers. I mean, everything is kind of connected, right? That's what I think I really enjoy about his work. That's what I really fell in love with. Um, I think it was the Demon book. What was it called? He, we were just talking about it. The one with the, the, the font. Demon with Fire. The demon. Running with the Demon. Um, that book yeah. was amazing to me because it was built in an urban landscape, right? A nightmare urban landscape. 
Mm -hmm. um, so it has this, this sense of urban fantasy to it, this uh, dystopian, really horrible future. And it's our world that's been disintegrated. Even in Swords of Shannara, the beginning story, it, it is our world just in a future state where the fantasy backdrop. You got to love right. that, right? I mean, this is Earth. Right. There's a so he did a TED talk about why he writes about elves. And he talks about that basically saying the reason that he writes what he writes is he was trying to find answers to the questions that he has about our world now. He just took those same issues, and a lot of writers do this, you know, just took or any creatives in general, just take the issues from the current world and put them in your own world. You know, so he says global warming is a great example, is you know, I wanted to write about something that has weight, but then what if you think about global warming now? So what if I put that in this other world where global warming could have, it's kind of like this magic thing that's slowly eroding the world. And if you knew something about it, how much of your life would you give up, you know, to deal with that part of it, all of it. And that's the questions his characters face. And so that's why he wrote a lot about what he writes about, which I think is cool. You're just taking the same issues the urban problems we have today and applying them to fantasy and the whole magic question though right i mean that's what gets me i typically don't really write fantasy stories with magic no but i do you know i have to have an excuse i love paladins because then you can have a god that gives the paladin the power you know what i mean mm -hmm. i also like it when magic comes from something like a chemistry reaction or or something along those well, lines alchemy or yeah, yeah man something like that i mean metallurgy i love stuff like that where you know there might be an element that could work if you just know the secrets because we don't know everything I'm just, i like it the, the mysteries of science or whatever it's just when it comes from nowhere i don't know where does this magic come from but there's a druid i know that for sure and there's a sword right i think there's a sword is yeah sword magical? It's, well there's the, there's the sword of shinar it is magical but what's up with the sword though let's start with that what's the sword the Sword of Shannara reveals the truth about the user. And that was part of the reason why the Warlock Lord in the end of Sword of Shannara is defeated because he thinks he's still alive or that he's this big, powerful sorcerer. And actually, he's not once the sword reveals his true identity that he's not as powerful or that he's not as cool as he thinks he is. But then there's things like the Elf Stones. There's the Black Elf Stone. There's the Wish Song. But those are all, I'm trying to remember, those are all used, the elves can use those, but then if you have elven blood, you can use them also. So you have to be basically an elf before you can, or you have to be a druid and then go to Paranor, which is kind of like the adult version of Hogwarts in yeah. the Shinar world. You know, so how to be. 77, right? And you said he was writing this thing in high school, mm -hmm. this sort of truth. I mean, it's ridiculous, right? Why yeah, does that catch? I mean, why, <laughs> it's just like, well, it's a sort of truth and it works. You love it. You're okay with yeah. it, right? Yeah. It's a trope. It's a horrible trope, though. Isn't it the sort of truth? Isn't it from other things? Isn't I it don't like think a... so. I mean, I think or now, is it now? so many stories out there now, but when, you re when I read it when I was a kid in the 90s, it was like the coolest thing. You know, that was like the coolest reveal ever. But there's always the something of truth now right the mirror of truth, yeah. the stone of truth or the truth is kind of an easy you know because there's a lie or a truth it's a positive negative it's a really easy plot device to use that you can oppose it with something else to get a, re a resolution at the end of your story yeah i read uh terry goodkind's wizard's first rule that whole series actually was fantastic turns out nobody likes it and i'm like the only one but really yeah, i've but... never read any of terry goodkind it gets very rapey. Like Ooh. there's this, yeah, there's a whole army that kind of devastates the the world. It's really fantastic series. It's really fantastic. If you like that kind of, you got to get this bad guy because he's so horrible and he does horrible things. And you know, if one of the good guys falls into his hands, there's no saving them at all. Mm -hmm. There's a character. I like a good bad guy. Yeah, Always a fan really of a good bad guy. Starts out with a good bad guy and he kills him, you know, at the end of the book. That's how he finishes off that first novel as he kills the bad guy and the second novel he has to start out with no bad guy but he did a really good job of building up this one i highly recommend the series um but there's a character in it called the confessor or something along those lines and she can touch somebody and make them tell the truth no oh, matter what they like, they like fall in love with her or something and they have to they have to 
follow her bidding. It's like a punishment or something along those lines. It's really, it's really interesting. Highly recommend it in terms of that. It's unique. Do you, do you think that there's a lot of use of magic systems in fantasy now? Do we have to differentiate, you know, like if you think about Tolkien and the Fellowship of the Ring, there's not really like a, there's kind of a system, but there's kind of not, but I know a lot of fantasy yeah. writers will spend years world building and Why even right i don't even care that much i mean even in terms of the the world the the J.R. tolkien stuff right he did the guy was uh the one with the magic was a god that was a, that was the excuse for gandalf wasn't there all the elves or no, all the wizards eventually. were coming from some kind of eventually was the excuse or yeah. no wasn't it always the excuse they were coming from some demigod status where they knew what was happening and they could interact and kind of push things but they weren't mortal. Right. No, in the beginning there was the one, Aru, and then yeah, they were all basically descendants of that and come to Earth. And then at the end of the Return of the King, they all go off to the dying lands or whatever, and that's basically Tolkien saying, "Now they're going to heaven where they belong." Middle no, Earth. That's interesting, Tolkien right? Was the same thing. Yeah, Middle Earth was Middle Earth. This Earth now. He wrote that as you know that was on Earth just happened a long, long time ago. Yeah, it's interesting. Yeah. He probably didn't believe in evolution. He was a freaking Catholic all the way, right? And probably, <laughs> right. Yeah. probably I believe the so. Earth was like three thousand years old or something ridiculous. Right. Well, the other I'm thing about cool scientific about genius here. No, the other thing that was cool about <laughs> the other thing that I find awesome about fantasy and Terry Brooks is the maps at the beginning of a book. Yeah. Totally right, and that's J.R.R. Tolkien all the time. Terry Brooks is J.R.R. Tolkien. Tolkien that he can't be without him. This is just a, a bastardization of those three, four books, five books. That's interesting, and I've heard a lot of people say that, and I, I don't know if I agree or disagree. So a lot of guys like me and you would have played D and D. D and D was where I cut my teeth as a kid. You know, that's where I learned oh. about dragons and elves and dwarves. I was like who I want to find out more about you. And I did my entire life trying to rediscover that moment of magic, that D and D experience, video games, probably for you, you're a little bit younger. Maybe it was video games, mm -hmm. Baldur's gate or something along those lines, Terry Brooks, easy way into video games, right. Or star Wars right. or something along those lines. Um, but I mean, I never played D &D. I never, you never played D and D. &D. No. Wow. Do you, I, what do you, do you play role playing games? Yeah, me too. I can't find a group to save my life that sticks to it. I'd love to do this totally um, internet as an option. You can get online very easily if you want to deal with it. I fall asleep. I like zone out. I can't deal with it. <laughs> I think one of the reasons that I never played it, so that there's one of the reasons I never played World of Warcraft is because I know that if I do it, I will never do anything else. It was it would be hard. all that I would do because it's literally the world I want to live in. I would yeah. love to be a Oak Mat or Ogre Magi or whatever, and just cast spells all day. And granted, you got your degree in engineering. Yeah, you got my degree yeah, in English. So I, but I played mm -hmm. four years of EverQuest, man. I mean, as soon as I discovered that game, I just stayed on that game forever. Quest thing. See, I played Warcraft, <laughs> Warcraft Two, and Starcraft. Those were oh, the, the the role the the real time strategy games or whatnot. Yeah, real time strategy. But then there were the Elder Scrolls three games. Played a lot of those. Oh man, there is another Elder Scrolls coming out. Did you hear? I have not heard. There well, I don't know what it's called or whatnot, but it was announced at uh, I think EQ E three E three. There was a there's a trailer too. It's a tweet. It's a teaser. I mean, it's nothing right now. Probably, but yeah, totally about it. Did you play the online version of that game? No, I did not. I just played it all on my Xbox. That was it. That's I never had stuff, the big, man. super powerful computer to be able to play a lot of those games, so I just had to wait for it to come out on Xbox or 360 to be able to play it. I, but I, I built my own Elder computer. 3, what's that? You built your I own built, computer? Yeah, I built my own computer and played it just to play that game, yeah. And then um, I bought an Xbox 360 to play Grand Theft Auto because it was taking forever to come out of oh, computer. That's cool. So what's the last Terry Brooks book that you read? 
probably running demon or running demons or whatever that one book was called i think that was the last one and you know we cannot forget to not to mention the um magic kingdom i was sale. waiting oh. when this would come up that's a series i have not read i've not read I any of those books. read every single one of them except for the one that was written in 2009 are they good? All the ones up to that point, yes, they're really freaking good. They're they're basically all the tropes in the world thrown together that you want in a fantasy setting, and you take a guy that's an accountant on regular Earth and throw him onto this other plane of existence where there are unicorns and dragons and evil wizards, and, you, and they're horrible I and mean, they're bad, but they're just they're fun to read. I guess all this stuff is kind of horrible and bad, but it's fun to read. I mean, he's one of the better ones, isn't it? He? He's very approachable. Yeah, I would say so. Absolutely. And I, you know, I was reading the sword a little bit the last couple of weeks, getting ready for us to talk here. And I still, maybe it's just nostalgic, you know, a total nostalgia. No, it's not movie, because but... he's popular. So it, it has to be something else besides nostalgia. You have to be resonating with the quality of the writing itself. Right. I think he's a great writer. One of the things that I like about how he writes is how he gets into his characters' heads and talks about and narrates the thoughts of his characters. I think a lot of people or writers have trouble with that. If I'm reading a book, it's kind of funny because I read, it was all I read when I was a kid. And I know we keep coming back to that, but I'm always sort of comparing to how do they, how does a writer do this? You know, but I always have this Terry Brooks thing in the back of my head because it's so ingrained in me since I was a kid. And I almost wonder if my writing or anything would be different if I hadn't discovered Terry Brooks until I was an adult. I mean, in terms of the, um, you who did you go to from Terry Brooks? Who was your next fantasy author? Oh, Robert Jordan, because then I discovered oh, the yeah. time, and then I cranked through the first four or five of those books, and then I just they got to be too. I don't want to say too much, but I guess my tastes started to change. Later on, I guess if you had finished that series, it would have been a natural progression into like uh, Sanderson. You read him? I've never, I've never read any of his books, but I've heard. Is it Drist? Is the elf? No, um, you're thinking of Robert Salvador, Salvador Roberts, or something like that. Oh yeah, R. Yeah. Salvatore, Salvatore or something like that. Yeah, yeah he wrote mm -hmm. the the Drist books. Man, that he popped on that character hardcore. It's amazing how this could work, right? Terry Brooks is, boom, on one novel, he's good, and you said he wrote in high school. Right. I mean, this dude's yeah. a lawyer, too. I mean, are we work you're an engineer. So, I mean, you must be in the same ballpark in terms of intellectual capabilities. Washington yeah, but not writing University. <laughs> not well, writing. writing. What is it, we, though? I mean, Dean R. Kuntz says it's just rules. If you know how to use the rules, you're a good writer. That's all it is. It's nothing more than that. Any poet just uses the rules but breaks them, I, I guess. So. But then it's kind of that luck thing, too, that your writing just happens to stick with people more than others might. I don't know. Is it luck? Because, I mean, it is a mixing. It's an equation, right? I mean, as a math person, as a mathematician, you have to understand the what George Lucas did in Star Wars is blending a whole bunch of elements together and just like something that resonated. And I don't know if he did it on purpose or not. And if you think about it too much, it becomes messy right but you know it's happening regardless and that's what you're aiming for at the end of the day i guess absolutely and that's what terry Brooks want, is doing too well it's almost like why do you write you know and then you think about i want the reader to have the same feeling that i had when i i want the my reader oh, to have yeah. the same feeling right. that i had when they when i first read terry brooks and finished the let, let me have that, my reader to have that. Yeah. Yeah. yeah let me have that book i'm gonna throw it into this fire you'll fight for it <laughs> you know, you'll, yeah. you'll cry if you leave it behind. I mean, yeah, that's the best feeling in the world. That's why you pick up all the books. That's why I have like 150 books on my phone right now that are like half started because I can't get in them. You know, I want that feeling. I don't want to force it. I'm not in school anymore. No, you know, you're not, not into it. You're not into it. Yeah, I'm not, I'm not being forced to read Faulkner here. I want to be enjoyable. I want to read something that's fantastic. That's funny you mentioned Faulkner and the Terry Brooks TED Talk, he talks about William Faulkner being his big inspiration, actually. For oh, that's writing. horrible. We can't. That's dumb. That's not yeah, good. Yeah, and not J.R.R. Tolkien. But that's interesting. He says that he wanted to write something with weight, which is why. Yeah. And Faulkner wrote with weight. His writing had weight. 
Faulkner did write with weight and he wrote with like a mystery, right? Like you couldn't just read a Faulkner story and go, all right, you had to work on it a little bit, right? You had to work those characters. Those characters kind of existed in their world. And they didn't care that they were being read. But if you read right. Terry Brooks, he has the same opportunity. I mean, I don't know the characters' names. Let's see if I can pull it up real quick. In uh, Sword of Shannara, the main characters are Hicks, right? They're from a farm in the middle of nowhere. They have no formal education. They're just basically uh, shady farmers. Bits in the south right? they're, they're just basically farmers ranch i don't know, ranchers little mountain people or whatever but if you got up close to them how would they talk would they talk like a lawyer writing dialogue you know perfectly with commas or whatever you wouldn't probably understand a word they're saying and if you acted too smart around them they'd probably pop you in the mouth i don't know <laughs> yeah maybe get to that level of detail i think it was i think that's Faulkner, character... though isn't it like Faulkner would have you go in and he would tell you that there are patches on their toes or whatever. They look like Hicks and they've got the violent mm -hmm. tendencies of Hicks or what. I don't know. Maybe they're nice. I don't know. Yeah, nice you're, right, you're right. Well, Terry Brooks does that, but he doesn't, he's got it between, he's got gnomes instead of Hicks or he'll have orcs instead or um still though right i mean if you're gonna have a dwarf coming from the mountain you want to have that dwarf reflect the environment that that, com that it comes from right if living inside of a mountain it provides you with a certain level of education then the dwarf is going to come out knowing what the world is outside the mountain otherwise if he's like what the fuck is this there's a whole new world <laughs> out here and he's you no know, surfing it for the first time he's going to seem like a lost person thing that doesn't know what's happening and we don't like that, do we? In society, if somebody shows up and breaks all the rules because they don't know, steps on your toes or whatever, culturally, mm -hmm. you get annoyed. No matter how nice you are. I mean, you're a pretty nice guy, but if I just started in, to do strange things in terms of your culture, you'd be upset. You know, you wouldn't oh, want yeah. to do the podcast Absolutely. anymore. You'd, you'd let me go and probably ask that Absolutely. I delete the, the record of it or whatever. Mm -hmm. You know, there's an obligation to be aware of the society and do these kids know they get introduced to a brand new society and how do they mix so well together it's interesting that he wants to write more weight do you think he did that i don't know is that writing more weight looking at it that deeply because i do think faulkner did that and i don't think terry brooks came close i would agree with you i think at a characterization level on something like that very deep it would be hard to say it was weighty can you I have remember... When I was reading it, I just remember going, this is fun. This is a cool story. Fun, right? But yeah, that's a I different have... emotion. Because Robin is Williams different... is a genius, right? Robin Williams is a freaking genius, but he also did some weighty ass shit. Like he was in, um, you know, Will Hunting or whatever. That movie was actually Good Will Hunting. That was a brilliant role. Mm -hmm. He played the clown in the role that he needed to play at that particular moment in time and won an Oscar for it. But he's tried to do that before. He just tried to do that in other roles, and it comes off flat, and people make fun of him. Well, so it'll be interesting to see what Terry Brooks' science fiction series Street Freaks will be well, about now that he's. What is he good at? He's good at turning your. He's good at sucking you in and turning the pages. And you've read him a lot over the last ten years, and you're saying that he still maintains that grip on you. I actually think. He doesn't for me anymore, which is hard no. for me to say. And it, Interesting. Yeah, and the first like 12 or 15 books of Shannara are fantastic. I love them to death. But then at, after a point, it sort of became this thing for me where, all right, it's a little more of the same. Maybe I'm growing up. Time to branch out into other things and not just read Terry Brooks anymore. You know, because he actually connects, yeah. eventually he'll connect the, the Demon and Void series. He connects them to the Shannara series. Oh, yeah, absolutely. I didn't, I knew he was doing that. I thought it was really obvious, right? He, right. I was like, yeah. man, this, I love the idea that, in fact, I want to write something that puts fantasy in the world that we live in right now. You know, mm -hmm. where sneakers absolutely. and clothes have kind of have these magical properties to them or something along those lines because of his Shannara connection with our world. I thought that was brilliant. There's some really cool stuff like the um, the journey of the the voyage of the Jural Shannara. There's a series of three books there where they actually leave the main island 
the mainland that the Sword of Shannara takes on, and they go to a different island, and it's almost like this wrecked island of our time now, what would be our time now, but maybe thousands of years in the future. And that is a very cool concept in those books because it's the current world now abandoned thousands of years ahead of time, but then there's still the element of magic underlying everything. And he ties that together very, very well with the technology, the use of magic, the characters and how they approach it. So I don't know if you've read those, but eventually, no. you know, those are like book books 12, 13 and 14 of the Shinar series. So you got to go quite a ways. Right. It moves out of traditional epic fantasy eventually. But I still have to read the most recent Shinara series books themselves. No, man. I like the world that we're living in right now because books are just endless and find them all over the place. Back mm -hmm. in the day, you know, if you surf in libraries or whatever, you're constantly waiting for the new stuff. Mm -hmm. Never quite sure what you're going to get on any visit. You know, it's a grab bag of books, basically. Or you're you there aim. and it's checked out. Yeah, you can <laughs> aim, but you, you might get disappointed, you know, and you might have fines. I mean, bookstores were a luxury. Nobody were, I didn't have the opportunity. I mean, I had boxes and boxes of books too somehow, but I know I got them for free someplace. You know, I constantly stole Thanks. books wherever I found them. Uh, none of them were brand new. So I never really aimed what I read, but I did read a lot of um, Terry Brooks. You I'm know? looking at, so... But I have not tried to read any of them recently. I, we moved into a new house about two years ago, and about half of the boxes we brought in were just books between exactly, the two. Exactly, man. Socks, and, doesn't it? And I'm looking at them now, and actually another writer that I grew up reading was Alistair McLean, who wrote Guns of Navarone and um, Santorini. For a second there, I thought you said you grew up with him. I was like, dude, the Guns of Navarone was like old. Oh, yeah. I wish I <laughs> kidding. No, my he, like, so you know somebody that, famous? <laughs> yeah, no, not at all. No, all the Alistair McLean books I grew up reading too. So sorry, not just Terry Brooks, but I'm looking at these other ones. So those are really influential on my writing also because those were great adventure stories. Like Guns of Navarone is an awesome adventure story that could be yeah, oh, taken I saw the movie. out of this. Yeah, they could be taken out of this world's context and culture and put into a fantasy world. And the same rules would apply. You just add elves or orcs or whatever, and the story would still be great. You'd still have a good story. Well, isn't Marvel kind of showing us that now, too, where you can have a mystery story or a spy story or a caper story with Iron Man or whatever, even a terrorist or a war story? And you can just throw in a superhero. Yep. You know, yep. they still have the same kind of pitfalls and tribulations as a normal person. They mm -hmm. just look different. You know, Red Skull's just yeah, whatever. I don't know what Red Skull's powers are, but you know what I mean. Uh, you throw Abraham Lincoln into a vampire story. Yeah. Really, Abraham Lincoln mashups. Or vampire slayer or whatever those. <laughs> who wrote I'm that? Working, I'm show. working with this publisher who wants stuff like that, right? Like they ask for stories on for capers or whatever. So I have to write a caper story. So I'm a science fiction fantasy author. So how do I write a, ca a caper story within the context mm -hmm. of fantasy or science fiction? You know, I want to stay true to what I want to write, but I also want to give them what they want. And it was fun. I've written like two pieces. I'm writing a third one, the slasher story. I'm trying to throw for it into publisher? a science fiction. Yeah, for the same publisher. You know, so it's interesting. People want that kind of stuff. They want these kind of mashups of of genres i mean going back to star wars you know star wars is a mashup of you know the hero's journey and samurai tales and and what have you right what else is in star wars tons of stuff what else is in terry brooks lots of jr tolkien right what and, else? Like, and where does this robert, guy get his inspiration well robert yeah jordan? right yeah robert jordan there's a lot of um jr tolkien too tolkien right they're right there yeah, they both have ents you know except i can't remember what robert Jordan I mean, we're talking about the next generation, right? These people are feeding off of J.R.R. Tolkien's work and developing their own work based on it. I mean, Stephen King did the same thing with his uh, gunslinger stories. He yes, even says did. so. If you've read his book um, on writing. Yep. Right? Several yeah. times. And he mentioned that like, they were in a race to write the biggest freaking fantasy story possible. Right. Mm -hmm. it, it wasn't really a race to write the best. It was a race to write the biggest. You know, the if you biggest. read those words, he's like, we don't, we weren't writing Pulitzer Prize winning 
material. No, we want we a page after page there. after page. Where's it come from, man? Where did they have their inspiration for this J.R. Tolkien? I mean, was this dime store literature in the 50s? Could you pick up tons of fantasy stuff like this? I guess you could. Asimov and whatnot, right? I don't know. I don't know where you'd even find it. But then you think about, okay, look at like Joe Abercrombie or Patrick, is it Patrick Rust? Rutherford, how do you say it? Lovecraft, name? right? Or the the guy yeah. who wrote Conan the Barbarian. I mean, God, I guess there were work out there that even J.R.R. Tolkien could have potentially been aware of, mm-hmm. right? I mean, he wrote in this, I, I love it, so I'm not really, I'm not making fun of it, but I mean, it's a trashy world to write in, right? You're writing about elves and magic and stuff. It's not considered literature. J.R.R. Tolkien was a linguist in a, a prestigious university. Oh, was yeah. He regarded yeah. As a fantasy writer in that university, no, right? Probably was slightly embarrassed. Maybe. Yeah, and then, I don't know how he felt about his work publicly. I'm not sure. I, I, there's not, I don't know any interviews that he ever did or anything that you can find now. You can find him reading his stuff, I know for sure. That's an interesting yeah, yeah. question. Yeah, I've done, I did a podcast on him, but I didn't ask that question. I don't know how he felt. A friend of mine, a friend of mine and I went to Oxford a couple of years ago and we walked to his house, Tolkien's house. Just to yeah, say Oxford that Oxford reg- regards him as a god, right? I mean, he's a hero to yeah. Oxford. Him and um, C.S. Lewis and even um, there's a few folks that went to Oxford, like Christopher Hitchens. I don't know if you read anything by him. I don't know. He was a, no, he was a great writer that died a couple years ago. But he wrote a really good biography on Thomas Jefferson, Christopher Hitchens. But those guys all went to Oxford, and they have a really cool writing history at Oxford. And Tolkien used to ride his bike to work. But you've done another podcast on Tolkien. So. Oh, I didn't even talk about that either. I'd, I'd love to do doubles on these guys because you never know, man. I mean, first conversations, like even Terry Brooks. I mean, something might pop up later on for you that mm-hmm. might influence a whole conversation. I mean, ultimately – these guys settle down into a niche. I think publishing in general from the 80s and 90s and the 2000s were looking for the easy road towards entertainment, right? You think Potentially. so? I don't know. It's my lifetime, man. I, I can't dwell beyond it. I can only guess that that's what they're doing. But they see it seems like the work is homogenized. Like this guy's not I'm striving. Trying to think, to... I'm trying to think of what Terry Brooks said about Lester Del Rey because Del Rey has published – all of the the Shannara books. Yeah, Del Rey is also big in the westerns too, right? I mean, they have a huge catalog for the speculative stuff. Yeah, and I think that they were trying to make fantasy this big thing. It's weird how things go in cycles, right? Because now the fantasy and since, you know, given Lord of the Rings and so now fantasy is kind of coming back and science fiction is really coming back with things like The Expanse and Game of Thrones, you know, in the next 10 or 15, 20 years, fantasy and science fiction is what you're going to want to be writing because now people's tastes are gravitating towards those two genres. And you can mix and match those genres however you want. And you can make them fun. Like yeah, the that's Witcher. the thing, right? I mean, you really can mix all these things up. And if you really get down into it, if you have a, a space story, it's going to have elements of other, it's going to have elements of other stories in it. Have you read The Witcher or any of those books? No, I played the game. Does that count? <laughs> sure. Yeah, I think they follow pretty closely to the books, but those books it's are a really beautiful cool. game, man. It's like playing in a painting. I totally enjoyed the experience. I've seen people play it. I haven't played it personally, but it does look awesome. And Netflix picked up The Witcher, and they're writing a show based on the first set of books, I think, right now, or the first, The Last Wish, which was the first book, which is a collection of short stories which will be really cool to watch if they do it right. Yeah, totally. Um, so Del Rey is owned by Penguin. So oh, they, they are. I didn't know. Yeah. And they were owned, they were actually under the editor, editorship of Del Rey and his wife. So there's two people named Del Rey. I don't know how the hell that works. But they've always done the speculative stuff, science fiction and fantasy. Well, and then Tor, too, aren't they? Aren't they no. publishing a lot? Tor is of- different. Tour is totally different. Really? I looked this up earlier today because I just submitted something to Tour, to, and I thought maybe Penguin was uh, there or they were an imprint of Penguin. No, they're by themselves. Actually, I'm not. I don't even know who Tour Tour is an imprint of. They might be a, an imprint of somebody. 
some reason, I think they're independent, though. Interesting. Well, what are your works that you're submitting right now, if you don't mind me asking? Oh, it was a science fiction piece. Okay. I don't know, man. I wrote it on speculation for this particular thing. So, <laughs> who the hell knows? Feel good about it? You feel good about no, it? No, never. Feel, I, don't, I don't feel good about anything I send in. You just get rejected no. too much. You, ex you yeah. assume that's what's going to happen, ultimately. Mm -hmm. You're just going to get rejected. At this stage, you just assume there's going to be a bigger name they want to publish. Mm -hmm. Maybe. Or books. I don't know. You ever hear well, you gotta, or... Are you going to self-publish any of your stuff? I don't know. I'm still debating. What about you? Probably. The space opera will be self-published. And then the podcast that I'm working on for next year will also be kind of a self-published series of episodes it's hard to we'll... say because i mean you have a um an interview series that you publish and mm -hmm. if somebody's coming to you to read that interview series they're probably not reading your interviews they're reading the author's words that you wrote right the people probably. who are retweeting or whatever so the difficult thing will be when you sell your novel who are you selling it to those people who are looking for those other authors or you know what I mean? Yeah, That's I'm my problem because sure. I'm like, is the podcast going to sell the book or is the book going to sell the podcast? You know what I mean? I have no clue. Right. It might work a little bit of a both ways. I just don't know. These indies, I don't know. Do they work out? Are you saying that indie publishing is uh, beneficial for new guys without like thousands and thousands of people on them? Like back when yeah. Twitter first started, you could gather followers really easily, I think. And yeah, now it's could. like, you could, it's now it's slowed down significantly. But there's still a lot of people on Twitter, and it's interesting. Should I use Twitter? Should I use Facebook? Should I do Instagram? You should use all of them, right? I mean, you should just get as much content out but there I'm as you can. I'm only on Twitter. I'm only on Twitter right now. I'm, I know I sent you an email about Reddit a while ago. Thank you for sending me back that feedback. And I'm, I'm going to take like one at a time each year, like maybe Instagram next year, or it might be Reddit next year, but I'm not. I'm only doing Twitter in 2018 until I figure out how to keep using it. Well, I think I ultimately it's about communities. It's finding those places, those niches. Mm -hmm. and it's really easy to do. If you've seen on Twitter, I mean, you did it. And I don't, I think you maybe even did it on an accident. But then again, you're an engineer, and this is kind of like what engineers do. What you did was kind of put a bunch of people together, and every single week, another couple of people are added to that list. And I just mm -hmm. follow those new people and watch this list kind of go. I haven't it's invited. Cool, isn't it? I don't think, yeah, I like it a lot. I I haven't really invited anybody from the list to be on the podcast. I don't think, but for me, it's beneficial. It's like a list of authors that would probably love to talk about their craft. You know, Absolutely. I mean that's that's cool. It's adding one person each week, and now it's now I can't do it in just one tweet, and now the two tweets that it takes are almost full. Yeah, I like it a lot. So I mean, I follow those authors, and now I'm looking at what they're writing, you know, on on Twitter, and that's why I'm interested. Um, I'm not sure what to use Instagram for at all. Some people call like this thing called Bookstagram. See, the thing is, oh. Terry Brooks came up in a world where this is not necessary, right? We no, go to another Terry stuff Brooks, was around, right? I mean, if we go to Terry Brooks's Twitter page, have you do you follow him on Twitter? I do. Oh, millions, right? I would imagine. I can't I remember. I misspelled his name. I'm ridiculous. T E R R Y. He has a thousand followers. This is not Terry Brooks. I think there's a fake account <laughs> for him. Yeah, it looks like that's the thing. Um, yeah. But he's not on Twitter. I've got to give you a five minute warning here, by the way. For our yeah, that's cool, man. You gave me an hour. Um, we'll wrap up. Um, but yeah, Terry Brooks is not on Twitter. Um, I'll look really quick because I know that I was just looking Terry at Brooks his Terry Brooks is on Twitter. I lied yeah, to you. Yeah, he is. And he, he is, actually is not got... good at Twitter. 22,000 followers. He's horrible. Yeah, it's interesting it's to see how many people, who follows who. Oh, you do that too? You look at to see who they follow? Because I feel like bit. the people that these authors are following, I should follow too. A uh, John Scalzi's got 150,000. Yeah, but I think like the John Scalzi's and the Chuck Wendig's and those guys, 
use their Twitter more to say just funny stuff, which makes more people want to follow them. Where Terry Brooks that's, is more like, yeah, totally. Hey, you know, here's my book, and you know, he's not on Twitter saying things that Chuck Wendig is saying. So I don't, you know, those twenty four thousand people are like me, where they grew up reading his books, and that was all they knew. Yeah, you know, he is a generation behind at this point. I mean, we are going to be wrapping up his life in the next, you know, ten years. I know, and then who's going to pick up the who's going to pick up the Terry Brooks baton for writing? Do you need to pick it up at that point? Do you want to pick up the Terry Brooks baton? I mean, is there is there know. any need to continue the Shannara trilogy at no, that point? No, Isn't no. it the danger that these things never end? Don't you want to cap off your stories by the time your your ending comes? You would or think so, okay unless you're this, the right? um, Why am I blanking on the guy that wrote Game of Thrones? Why can't oh, G R R Martin. Oh yeah, George Martin. And so now he's pumping out one book every four years. And he, you know, the show is now ahead of the books. You know, and now yeah, you're going, now what do I do? I think that dude's pretty smart, right? I mean, it's like, why bother? It's never going to end, dude. You're not going to be satisfied. There's always going to be a, a, a loose hanging yeah. strain. But then I mean, Robert I, Jordan passed and Brian Sanderson took up the rest of his couple uh, of books. Brian, his name's not Brian. Jordan and Brian. It's not Brian. Robert Sanderson? No, I have no clue. It's not Brian, though. <laughs> no, okay. no. Some, um, something Sanderson. Somebody else took his books, but... Brandon Sanderson's his name. Oh, thank you. Yes, Brandon Sanderson. Now he's driving a crazy I person. I want to pick up the Terry Brooks baton because I want to just leave the books and his legacy, and I want that to stick and be there for all time. I wouldn't want to be the person that came in and tried to reproduce what he did because you couldn't. There's just no way. Would he? I mean, that's the thing. Sign of the times. And I did not know about uh, Jules Verne did the same thing. His career was like writing these adventure stories all the way through. All of them were like these travel adventure stories. Mm -hmm. that he died. You know what I mean? That was his entire career. Now, Terry Brooks is, you know, going to die within the next decade or two. And his entire life has been the Shannara series. He connected yep. them. Every book he writes has to be connected or he's going to make, I guess, only 22,000 people mad I guess he doesn't have as big of a sales as i thought it was going to be Twenty thousand is disappointing well then he might not have been on twitter very long either maybe man his probably his marketing person sucks or maybe he's just not tweet tweeting enough who knows twitter is a strange place you, i mean you and rice is uh, doing stuff on it you really do. You have to constantly be working. And even then, it doesn't matter sometimes. <laughs> no. Ann Rice is 184,000. Who? Isn't that the Rice? Ann Rice? That's the same ballpark. 80s, 70s? Yeah, but I don't know. She wrote, but was her genre a little more... Vampires. Interview Urban. With a vampire. Was Urban fantasy. A little more, it wasn't so far-fetched at the time. Or even now, maybe, yeah, Lord of the Rings book or movies are awesome, but the books are kind of weird still. You know, maybe some people still have that. This is a this has been a really fantastic conversation. In fact, what I'd like to do is have you come back on and we just continue talking about fantasy in terms of these books and what's out there and what we think about it and what we Google and whatnot. Um, I'd love to. Let's do that. Yeah, man. Let's just let's schedule something up. I'll put I'll try to get a hold of you. Um, I'll send you an email about September, maybe. We'll just continue with part two then. Yeah, that sounds good. I'm fine okay, with that. Cool. And we'll we'll do wrap this to, up. Um, do you need to redo an intro or anything? I've got no, my real name. No, I will cut all that stuff out. It'll be nice right. and neat, and there won't be any hint of mention of uh, pseudonyms or whatnot. It's all good. I trust you. <laughs> cool, man. Um, all right, I'll let you know when this comes out. I think it's about four weeks or so at this point with Mirages, which is good. Yeah, that's fine. I'm listening to them when I got time. So they're All good. Right, cool. You got some good, uh, you got a nice talent for talking with folks. I like what you're doing. Oh, uh, thanks, man. I appreciate that. If you have any criticisms, don't hesitate to shoot me an email. And if you want to write me reviews uh, or stuff, you can do that too. I don't oh, know how sure. to do the marketing thing. I have no freaking clue. Um, and the if you could give any way for me to help you with, uh, with, uh, what, uh, with, um, my do me interview. a favor. Tell me, yeah, tell me about your your interviews real quick, so I can feed this in the very beginning too, somehow. Oh sure. Uh, let me let me think. One thing I'll give you a tip is on your Twitter 
when you say so and so came out and did my interview, you don't often put their tag in there. You, oh, you mean the at thing? Yeah, yeah. You just say their name. I think if you put the at in there, that might be a more maybe it. You know, I've found that I have to put the at in because when I first did the interviews and I first started marketing them on Twitter, they there wasn't a lot of engagement. If you look at your Twitter analytics, but until yeah. you started putting the at in, then the anal then the, the engagement went up and the amount of times the tweet was seen and it brought more people to the article or to the site. What I noticed about you, and this is really good, is that you tweet your stuff out more than once. I didn't think about doing that until I saw you do it. And I'm like, okay, I'm gonna start doing that. But in terms of that um app thing, um, yeah, I debated, I still debate, should I do it or should I not do it? Yeah. Sometimes y'all send them a DM and say your your podcast is out. Mm -hmm. You wanna market it, ask me for links. I just felt like it like especially with the bigger names, like I was using their at to get attention. Yeah, the more as I wanted. I just felt awkward doing. It. I mean, the hardcore thing to do is just do it because it's going to benefit you in the long run. But the yeah. other, the other hand is like I just I hate the feeling of greasiness that comes with it sometimes. Oh yeah, for sure. Well, like when I do when I tweet about Hugh Howie, I'm going to tell him beforehand, like, hey, just so you know, I'm going to use your name, and is that cool? So yeah, he knows he's not exactly. Dry. Is that cool? The question is, I think is the important part. How do you want me to handle the marketing? I would like to market this. How do you want to help me market this? Or I don't know, ask the question, right. ask an important question. You don't want to look stupid either, I guess. That's the other, other thing is you don't want to embarrass yourself with dumb questions. Cause I really hope no. to like, you know, reach out to Daniel Abrams in like a year or so and say, Hey, would you like back on the show? And then he's all about it. You know, yeah. you never but then know. again, I didn't, I didn't add him. I don't even think I sent so him I a DM that. telling him that his freaking podcast that's how intimidated i was after the fact i just did not want to let him know anything <laughs> <laughs> no I, I just published i published him immediately because that's how excited i went but i did not even mention the publication to him that's how intimidated oh, that's i was funny i talked with my brother i was like dude i got hugh howie there's no this is there's, it's he's like no way you're kidding that's not even that's not real this isn't real that's pretty and cool, it's like man. well now what but yeah i can do a quick bit now about let's the keep doing it now let's keep reaching out, right? Now you get interesting. Now you start thinking about how you can make your interview series like sing somehow. Man, you how is a great example. You know, reaching out for those really interesting people. And it's the the there's like this long arcing conversation that continues between interviews, and it's really cool because yeah. It's not, it kind of started out about how do writers do this? How do they find time to write? What makes them productive and kind of the surfacey stuff. But now it's getting a lot deeper into, you know, like Joseph Pascal did a really cool piece about what would it be like if we could consume books instantly and how, and then how does the medium of the book and the it's story. so funny, man. How does My that story happen? is actually about something like that. Is Consuming, it? Okay. So yeah. An AI it's, that it's just kind of sucks information in. It's a fascinating concept, but then now it's kind of morphed into okay, as writers, how do we're we're not just writing books, we're writing stories, but how everybody is consuming those stories is changing. It's ebooks, it's podcasts, it's you know, um, what's the thing? Is I'm blanking on it right now. But you're, the medium is changing, and so do we have to adapt our writing to the adapting mind? We're not writing books for the same generations that the Terry Brooks's of the world's were a long time ago. You can't write the same. The attention spans are different. How do we adapt our writing to garner but you more? Know what? You know what you're doing? You're telling stories. That's ultimately boil it all the way right. down. You're sitting around a campfire and somebody's drawn on a wall with chalk. You know, the right. flames are flickering. It's telling a story because he's making you think it's telling a story. But, mm. you know, when the sun comes up the next day, it's just knobs on the cave wall, you know, painted white. Just nothing. It's and, nothing there. It's just, a, it's just a magic trick that you're trying to right. perform, right? And just trying to suck and, them in and make this magic work. Right. And then the interviews is cool, too, is because it exposes all of us to different things i mean you don't want to be like me where yeah. you just read terry brooks for your whole life right because because now you're getting i think it's great because people want to talk about this stuff man people want to show you what they've done absolutely i did this check me out and you might want to check them out yeah Some and then do. so 
I don't know if you read the Michael Ronson interview a couple weeks ago, the guy that wrote science fiction comedy. His books are hilarious. <laughs> oh, they are so funny. But his interview is he is a funny guy and he had but he has some really cool insight on writing and how to use humor and just and it doesn't even just apply to comedy, but applies to writing as a whole. So it's cool. You're getting all these different perspectives in this long overarching conversation over, you know, 30 interviews almost now. And I'm going to keep going with it. I originally said I'm going to do 52 one a week for a year and that's it. But now I'm thinking this is just well, it's got to be very passive, right? I mean, in terms of you get to introduce yourself to somebody and then say, would you like to fill out this this questionnaire, basically? Yeah, yeah, it's 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 reaching out and finding people to do it. You have to be sort of selective. Yeah. You know, because I want to approach the writer, not the published author, you know, because I think that all writers have something to say about writing, something good to say about writing that we all want yeah, to hear. I agree. Even the indies, anybody. I mean, ultimately, yeah. it's about salesmanship. It's about storytelling. Right. It's about putting craft out there. I mean, I love talking no matter. As some of my favorite authors so far have been indies. And they're Agreed. hardcore. And all... Like they don't want to do anything but be indies. They just build audience left and right on Twitter too, and they're really good at it. They're fantastic yeah, people man. to talk to. And we're all people in the arts world. Things. Never send a story to Clark's World ever. It I've done make... that. <laughs> I did send... that. Good for you, yeah, man. I sent it to them, and I sent them to Lightspeed. I've sent a couple submissions to them, and I didn't. They said no, or they responded saying sorry this didn't work for us and that's cool it's, you know, that's, what they're, that's what their form letter is man what you're aiming for is this didn't work for us because and then they give you a list of why it didn't work that's the next stage and right. it sucks it really does suck they think they're being nice and they really are they're helping you out but it hurts it's like oh shit i hate it <laughs> i know i love it yep. i really do like it i love the money that comes into even it might be the tiniest thing in the entire world but man when you cash one of those checks it's like it that's feels- when you're not for yeah. Stephen King, when you that get hurt. the check and you cash it and it doesn't bounce, you're an author. You're right. <laughs> okay. I thought he said pay a bill too. I thought paying a bill Maybe was part of that. Yeah. I got to go one step further. I got to pay a bill. I got to buy. Yeah, I've already got. The, I've got the money for my website next year. I'm happy. <laughs> there you go. There you go.